Hey guys, this is Stacy from eatthebite.com. And it's that time of year again. It's Thanksgiving. I made this entire Thanksgiving feast for about $95 and it will easily feed between eight and 10 people. This is a budget-friendly and beginner-friendly Thanksgiving dinner. I'll show you how to make turkey and gravy, stuffing, butternut squash, Brussels sprouts, mashed potatoes, and apple pie. It's very difficult to make all the food on the same day, so let's start by making a couple of things the day before. The stuffing. We need to finely dice some celery. First, we'll cut the celery stalks into thin strips, then we'll dice it into smaller pieces. It should look about like this when you're finished. Next, we'll peel a couple of apples, and after they're peeled, we'll cut them into smaller pieces. We'll cut the apple into four large chunks, like you see here. Then we'll cut them into larger strips, then dice them into smaller pieces. Similar as to how you chop an onion, but the pieces need to be cut into smaller cubes, just like this. I've got one large onion and I'll cut it in half, cut it into strips, and then dice it into smaller pieces, the same size as the celery. And you'll notice I've got two piles of ingredients going because I'm making a double batch of stuffing and need one set of ingredients for each pan. First, I'll melt some butter in each pan and start cooking the celery. Just give the celery a good mix around to coat in butter and let it cook a minute or two. Next, we'll add the diced onion to each pan, then we'll add the chopped apples. Make sure to give each pan a good mix around and let it cook for about two to three minutes. After that, just add chicken broth and bring it all to a boil. Once it's boiling, it's time to add our Pepperidge Farm stuffing mix. Here's a look at the bag and you'll need two of these to feed a larger crowd. Once you've added the stuffing mix to both pans, simply mix it around until all the dried stuffing mix is drenched in the broth. We want to transfer the stuffing to baking dishes, and then we'll press down on the stuffing to spread it out. When making the day before Thanksgiving, wrap it in plastic and store overnight in the fridge. After you remove the turkey from the oven on Thanksgiving Day, the stuffing can go in the oven while the turkey rests. I took some of the turkey juices, put it in a squeeze bottle, and poured it on top of the stuffing. Last step, add some thin sliced pats of butter and cook in the oven at 350 degrees for about 20 to 30 minutes. And if you want it to crisp a little, you can always turn the broiler on for a few minutes at the end. The next make-ahead recipe is the sautéed butternut squash with caramelized leeks and thyme. It's going to be cheaper to buy whole butternut squash that you peel and cut yourself. I've got two large butternut squash here. I'll peel them both with my veggie peeler. And only one half of the squash has the seeds, and those need to be removed. So we'll cut it in half, which takes a little bit of elbow grease. Cut it in half again, a little more elbow grease to get through it. You can use a spoon, but I had a melon baller on hand and it works really well to scoop out the seeds. Once the seeds have been removed, simply cut the butternut squash into thick strips like you see here. Then we'll cut them into bite-sized cubes, making sure they are approximately the same size. After all the squash is cut, we can start with the leeks. We're only going to use the light green and white part of the leek for this, so I'll discard the larger green part and start slicing the leek into rings. Once all the leeks are sliced, I soak them in water and I separate the rings. Leeks can be pretty dirty, so I like to wash them thoroughly after they've been sliced. You'll need two pans for this. I'll add olive oil to the butternut squash, and I melted some butter to cook the leeks. I'll add salt to both and then a little bit of fresh pepper to both as well. I'll start by giving the squash a good mix to make sure everything is coated in the olive oil. Then I wanna give the leeks a good stir around the pan as well. I'll put the lid on the squash and let that steam until it's fork tender. I'll stir the leeks a few more times while they're cooking, but we also need to chop that fresh thyme. First, I'll gently pull the leaves off the thyme stems. And then once I have a nice little pile going, I'll give them a fine dice. And my leeks are just about done, so I'll add the thyme to the leeks and give it a stir for a minute or two. My butternut squash is finished, and I'll add that to a large mixing bowl. Then I'll add the caramelized leeks and thyme to the squash. Last step, we're going to mix it all together until it's very well combined and then we'll transfer it to a serving dish. If you're making this ahead, you can wrap this and put it in the fridge overnight. This reheats great in the microwave and reduces your workload on Thanksgiving Day. Next up on our list of make-ahead Thanksgiving goodies is a killer apple pie with butter crust. Don't let making an apple pie intimidate you. It's actually pretty easy. It starts with peeling a bunch of apples. How hard can that be, right? Next, 
cut the apple into four large chunks, like you see here. Then cut them into larger strips, then dice them into smaller chunks. And yes, I prefer cutting the apples into smaller pieces, but if you prefer apple slices inside your pie, then you should go ahead and do that. We're gonna put them in a bowl with some white sugar, brown sugar, cinnamon, cardamom, cornstarch to help thicken it while it cooks. And now we're gonna mix all the ingredients together until everything is well combined. We'll set that aside to let the juices accumulate while we make the crust. We'll put some flour in a bowl along with sugar and salt and we'll give that a whisk together to combine and then we'll cut some cold butter into cubes and we'll add the butter cubes to the flour mixture. First, I toss the butter to coat in flour. Then I start mixing and squeezing all the butter and flour together to start forming the dough. You can use a pastry cutter for this and you can even use a food processor, but for some reason I get a lot of satisfaction making this dough with my hands, so here we are. When it looks like it's getting crumbly, we're gonna add a little bit of ice cold water, just a couple tablespoons at a time. Then we'll mix it together. You don't want the dough to be too wet, so be careful with the water you add here. Once the dough is formed, we'll put some flour on the cutting board and then we'll turn the dough out onto the flour. We'll add a touch more flour as needed on the top and then we're gonna shape it into one big mound of dough. After that, we'll cut it into two pieces, one for the bottom of the pie and one for the top. Shape each piece into a smooth ball of dough. Then we're gonna wrap each piece in plastic wrap and we're gonna stick it in the freezer for about 15 to 20 minutes. We wanna roll the dough out on top of the plastic wrap so we can flip it into the pie plate. Just add a sprinkling of flour on your roller and the pie crust as needed while you're rolling. Try to make the dough as even as possible and when it's ready, just flip it right into the pie plate. Then very carefully peel the plastic wrap away. Do the same thing for the top piece and as you can see, our apples have formed a nice juice and we'll start adding the mixture to the pie plate, including pouring the juices on at the end. We'll flip the top piece right onto the top of the pie and then carefully peel away the plastic wrap. Now it's time to fuss with the crust a bit. Just fold it over here and there and then we'll fork it around the edges. A butter crust does not hold a fluted edge well, so please keep that in mind. Forking is the best method. I beat one egg with a splash of water from my egg wash and I brushed it over the top of the pie. Then I took a knife and made four little cuts for vent holes. Last step, we're gonna sprinkle a little sugar on the top of the pie. Then we're gonna bake it in a preheated oven at 375 degrees for an hour or so. And here's our awesome Thanksgiving pie. Make this ahead of day and simply warm it in the oven on Thanksgiving day. The butter crust is to die for. This seriously is a no fail pie recipe and you're going to love it. So here's the recap. You can make the stuffing, butternut squash, and apple pie the day before Thanksgiving. The day of Thanksgiving, we're gonna make the turkey, gravy, mashed potatoes, and Brussels sprouts. Okay, it's time to talk turkey and gravy. I have a 19 and a half pound turkey and I'll start by lining a large baking pan with foil. Next, we're gonna transfer the turkey to the baking pan after you remove the gizzards and all those weird things inside. I try not to think about that. I like to take a minute to get to know my turkey and figure out which way it will fit in the pan best. There is a large flap of fat that I'll cut off right from the end here. Then I am going to brush the whole turkey with melted butter. Next, I took about a tablespoon of salt to generously salt the outside of the turkey. And make sure you lift up the wings and legs to get all the areas salted. Next is the twine or string. You'll need a piece of this to tie the legs together. And don't get overwhelmed by the string factor. Cut a long piece what looks like enough to tie the legs together. Just wrap the string around the legs like you see here and tie it in a knot. It's actually very easy, so don't freak out. Your turkey will have a thermometer on it. When this pops up, it means the turkey's done. I'll also take the internal temp with my food thermometer to make sure it's 165 degrees before consuming. We'll wrap the turkey in the foil until the last hour of cooking. And you wanna read the cook time on the turkey wrapper. For a 19 and a half pound turkey, it's gonna take about four to four and a half hours to cook at 325 degrees. So this was my turkey at three and a half hours, and I did wrap those turkey wings in some foil so they wouldn't brown any further when I put the turkey back in the oven. We need to remove some of the juices from the pan so it doesn't overflow, but we also need some to make an awesome homemade gravy. You can also use your turkey baster or a large spoon to baste the turkey with some of the juices, just like you see here. 
The foil did fall off the back of the turkey and I didn't know it, and it's fine. I removed the foil from the rest of the turkey and covered the part that had already browned with the foil. Problem solved, and none of it affected the outcome and flavor of the turkey. I put the turkey back in the oven for about an hour, and then when it came out, it was absolutely golden brown all over. And see? The little red popper thingy came out to tell me when the turkey was done. Now the turkey needs to rest for about 30 to 45 minutes. Just let it sit uncovered on the counter. We'll also take some more juices and fat out of the pan for our homemade gravy. We're going to need to chop some fresh thyme for the gravy as well, so I'll pull the leaves from the stems and give them a fine chop, just like you see here. If you're using chives to garnish your mashed potatoes, now would be a good time to chop those as well. I've got two cups of the turkey juices and I'll add two more cups of chicken broth. Then the fresh thyme, salt, a little fresh pepper, and my mom always adds a spoonful of stuffing, so I decided to do the same. We'll whisk the gravy so everything is well combined and we'll let it heat to almost a boil and now we'll add a slurry to help thicken the gravy. This is just flour and water mixed together. We wanna to get it nice and hot and then we'll turn the heat down low and let it thicken. So the turkey gravy is done. On Thanksgiving Day, while the turkey is resting, we'll prepare our Brussels sprouts with toasted pine nuts and bacon bits, as well as our mashed potatoes. First, we'll put some pine nuts in a small pan, and I'm gonna heat those on medium until they're browned and toasty. Next, I'm chopping five strips of bacon, so you've gotta plan your time to cook the bacon, and we'll chop that into bacon bits. They should look like this when you're finished. For the Brussels sprouts, this couldn't be any easier. Just cut off the bottom, cut it in half, and then put them in a pot with a steamer insert. Keep repeating this process for all of the Brussels sprouts. Cut off the bottom, cut it in half, put it in the pot. Cut off the bottom, cut it in half, put it in the pot. I do love roasting Brussels sprouts in the oven, but with limited oven space on Thanksgiving, I try to use my stove top for side dishes, which is why I steamed the Brussels sprouts. Once all the Brussels sprouts are ready, we'll put the lid on the pot. And we're going to steam these until they're tender. And here's a closer look at the Brussels sprouts once they've been steamed. Last step, I'm going to heat a little bit of butter in a pan. I'll add the bacon, the pine nuts, give it a stir until everything is well combined. Put the Brussels sprouts in a large bowl, add the bacon and pine nut mixture, a squeeze of fresh lemon if you'd like. Give it a good mix around, and then we'll transfer this to a serving dish. And you're done. Steamed Brussels sprouts with toasted pine nuts and bacon bits. And now the most important side dish, fantastic no-frills mashed potatoes. I go more classic mashed potatoes on Thanksgiving, and it starts with peeling a lot of russet potatoes. After they've all been peeled, cut them in half lengthwise, cut again lengthwise, then cut into uniform-sized cubes. I'm using two pots here because there are a lot of potatoes. We're going to cook these on high heat until the water boils and the potatoes are fork tender. If you're using a chive garnish and you haven't chopped the chives yet, now is a good time to get that done. Once the potatoes are cooked through, we're going to drain the water and put the potatoes in a large bowl. We'll add a bunch of butter chunks along with salt and pepper, and I've warmed some milk in the microwave. Please keep in mind that adding cold milk is not a good idea for this. Now I'll start blending using my hand mixer. We want to make sure all the potatoes are well blended. I usually just spin the bowl around a little to rotate and add more warm milk as needed to get the right consistency. And once you've gotten them just right, it's time to give them a taste. And let me tell you, these mashed potatoes rock. And here's the final result of all the hard work, a budget-friendly, beginner-friendly Thanksgiving feast. That's all for now. For this and all the printable recipes, you can visit my website at eatthebite.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.